that I would have liked to talk about because most of the characters, they were based on true characters that actually existed. Some of them had facial hair and some of them didn't have facial hair. But then because of the, we shot that on the height of the pandemic, which was in Oklahoma, and the humidity was like 95%, and people had to wear masks between takes. So there was a lot of like putting masks on, taking masks off, putting masks on and taking it off. So basically all the hand laid facial hair didn't last at all because that was stuck in those uh, masks. And so we had to come up with other ideas. So what we did is we took uh, and the glues, you know, the spirit gum, would then to become like they just sweated it off. And because of the nature of the skin, this, the, the glue wouldn't adhere or the beards wouldn't adhere to the glue because it was too moist. So we came up with facial hair that we created with super baldies. So we had a layer of super baldies that built a barrier between the skin and the, and the hair and then had made beards like just like you did with super baldies as a backing and then we were able to put them on and blend them in with alcohol and so they actually stayed that way. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's, de it's another process. De no, because we do the floating beards as well, which is, I think, is a, is a wonderful um, skill to know. Because right. otherwise, laying into a beard is time consuming. We don't have the time. But doing a floating beard, it's funny enough, I did talk to the class about a floating beard, mm -hmm. so they already are up to date on that. The Super Baldies is, is a great. Um, because they do that also with the prosthetics as well, don't they? Right, yeah. Is the super board is the um, it's like bald cap? It's a bald cap. It's like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like a film, it's very thin. It's what we what cap plastic would have been. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like if it's exactly. A, exactly. It's, it's, a, like a, it's a upgraded cap plastic. Yeah, if you do like a prosthetic and it's like a sandwich, so you have the super bold is on the one side uh -huh. and then yep. the. Then the uh, whatever you use for the inside. Exactly. You know, the Bondo or whatever Bondo you're using, exactly. yeah. That's right. And then you can seal it. Uh -huh. And it ca it's basically, it's, it's, it's what they call encapsulated. Mm -hmm. And once it's encapsulated... So can I just say that's one of my favourite words? <laughs> it's encapsulated. I like superstitious. <laughs> So, so, should we talk a little bit about the um, Phyllis of the Fair Moon and when you got approached about the subject? What, what, I mean, obviously, it, it comes out this. No, it comes out in October. Uh, in, uh, we have the LA okay. premiere on the 16th. Uh -huh. But when it actually hits the movie, there's that, I, I don't know. October 20th. October 20th. Okay. Um, and obviously, one, one of the things that always interests me about any project like this, because it was obviously such a massive. The research and everything that was involved in it, um, but apparently the project has been has been in development since 2017. I think so. And then eventually went into filming in 2021. 2021, and I came aboard very late. I got I was uh, surprisingly I was in Switzerland. I'm from Switzerland. Moved uh -huh. to America like 30 years ago, but I was at the time in Switzerland when the phone rang at three o'clock in the morning. And Daniel Lupi, our producer, live producer, was on the phone, and you know, I was like, oh, oh, who's there? And it took me a moment to actually, you know, wake up to realize what's going on and what they're talking about, and who's this, and what? And you know, he said, well, I just wanted to check on your availability to be part of this movie. And I said, trust me, and even if I wasn't available, I would make myself yeah. available. Who wouldn't? It's Martin Scorsese. Oh, Have you worked in before? No, I have never worked with him before. And so then 10 days later, I found myself in Oklahoma. I flew back the next, basically the next day, packed, shipped everything off, and went to Oklahoma. And, and because, I mean, I don't know much about, obviously, I've, I've done my research on Martin Scorsese. We all know who Martin Scorsese is, and I'm a massive fan. But does he do quite a lot of improvising as well, or uh, is he script? Well, the, script -led? well the, the way I experienced, our, my experience was that it was very, I mean, in the beginning we had a lot of Zoom calls mm -hmm. where he made it very clear what, you know, I mean, he didn't say force anything on you, but he suggested and he was definitely pointing out what he was looking for. In our case here, it definitely had to be authentic mm -hmm. and natural. And 
again the French the influence because you know the nature of the story. I don't know whether has everybody seen the movie or not. Or the trailer. We've seen the trailer. We've seen the trailer. We've seen the trailer. We've seen the trailer. Okay. Okay. Yes. So th this happened during the 1920s, where the Osage Nation they bought the, the mineral rights of the lands that they were living on, and within a few years they found uh, massive amounts of oil. And so within no time at all, they became per capita the richest people in the world. Which means that they had a lot of money at their disposal and they could, they were, you know, they were influenced by the French fashion, European fashion. And what was interesting is, or what was actually quite nice, I found that they kept a lot of their traditions, like the blankets, and like sitting around campfires and things like that. At the same time, they would start wearing makeup. They would wear high fashion, French fashion. They would, you know, they would close the, 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 the silk blouses, but then yet they were wrapped in a woolen blanket, you know. So, I mean, your hairstyle on Molly was very traditional. Was the, the, they're very traditional, and we had a hair department, which was Kate Giorgio. And who she lives part part time here, part time in New York. Mm -hmm. And so what she had, what she explained to me is that they had uh, added hair extensions to her in the beginning when she was healthy and fresh and and glowing. That so her hair would be fuller. And then over time, when she gets sick, uh, with when her when her health decreases, that they would take some of these extensions out mm -hmm. to make it look make it look more. Ready and not so full and healthy. Yeah. And you had somebody there, like you had a researcher with you on. on set. And I understand you used quite a lot of local give your side people as well. As well in yeah, we had uh, we had uh, um, Marion Bauer, who was one of the producers, but she led the research department. And she, they were, as you said, I mean, they started researching this movie in 2017 or yeah. something like that. And we would walk into her office and there were walls full of images of the original people, the characters, then folders of um, people that we were uh, duplicating or referencing or just the styles and everything. And any questions we had about research, even though we did our own, mm -hmm. uh, was basically at our hands because of Marion Bauer. Yeah, so you see, yeah. Oh, and and it's, it's, it's really interesting for all of you guys as, as students, you know, when you are um, doing research on anything, especially something and, and a part of history that is as sensitive as this particular story, um, you, it, it really is very, very important to get every single fact right. And, you, you know, what's so beautiful about everything that I'm reading about this project is that it was... It was definitely um, a given that the Osage people would be involved from start to finish to the point I think there was some blessing before the film even mm -hmm. started. Um, which, I mean, we did that um, on Constant Garden when we were out in Nairobi. It, 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 it's just one of those things where every, whenever you're filming and you're telling somebody else's story, you have to be really, really super respectful and make sure you're getting everything right. Um, and I think most importantly on this project, it was. You know, as I keep saying, I've been working on many, many movies that are based on a true story or inspired by true events. But here, you actually, you really have the true story, and this is the story of, uh, you know, this nation, this uh, the, the Osage Nation, and we shot at the Osage Nation, so we shot at the actual locations, we shot at the doctor's offices where this all happened, we shot at all these places, and most of our actors in front of the camera, or background actors, uh, or even behind the camera, part of the crew. We had uh, indigenous people that knew a lot or were very knowledgeable about the time, about their, <coughs> about their Osage nation, which is very helpful. And, um, and so it was all about, and everybody had a, who came to the movie, came into our makeup trailer, and I think it's great that you say respect that the said, oh, you have to be really sensitive about the subject matter because you, we, I don't know, I mean, I've learned a lot now 
because of my research, but I don't know the details, I don't know how this really works because I wasn't there, I'm not there, but then now. So, but then these people came and they all had relatives. They had a grandmother, the uncle of her grandmother's sister, somebody was killed, somebody was decapitated, somebody disappeared, never to be found again. And there were so many emotions. I mean, I get goosebumps yeah, right I get now. Day now so, right I mean, there were so many emotions on a daily basis in our trailer and tears just of people who come, came in and offered their support to this movie and this story to actually find closure and just to uh, tell the story uh, and to be able to put this behind them and move on. You know, mm -hmm. and so within that, you try to uh, create these characters, and which was very hard at times because it was yeah. such an emotional thing. You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, yeah. I mean, and you know, when you, it's, it's such a privilege to be able to tell these kind of stories, but it's mm -hmm. also, it's it's such um, a hard thing to have to take on board mm -hmm. as well because you know I, I've done a couple of films that. Are, along those lines where I've had to be, I've had to do the research, I, we, you, when you're recreating things that have actually happened, and you know that the generation that has been primarily affected is predominantly, maybe even still alive, you know, it's, it, it, but even not, the, the ancestors, you know, the next generations are carrying that hurt with them. You know, and it's, it's an incredibly hard thing to do, and it, it really does, when, whenever you're doing a project like this, it, it's, you, you do have to look at every aspect of that and just be able to sit down with the relatives. I mean, I've been on jobs before, and I'm sure that you probably, you probably had access on, on your job as well on this one, where you've had counsellors there as well, just in case something gets dragged up that is, you know, when, I know, I know in this particular story, I, I don't know that much about it, but I do know that a couple of people lost their lives to the cause of this story. Mm, yeah, no, and, that's the couple, I mean, a lot of people. A lot. And, yeah, and never, I mean, they were never found again. They were, mm -hmm. I mean, they just disappeared or they were, I mean, shot, murdered, poisoned, you name it. All for greed. And all for greed. Yeah. And, for, uh, and not many people have really been held accountable to yes. this day. I mean, you know. And, yeah, so. And as we, you know, as part of our. I mean, was, as a, a wonderful actress told me, thanked me for her, you know, I was a, I, I got a, 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 a Swiss Special Film Prize a few years ago, and the actress was have, having a speech, and she thanked me for her for the makeup, and she said that it wasn't just the makeup, the makeup products that they actually gave me, it was actually the mental makeup that you gave me, yeah. that actually helped her a lot to actually just not physically, just the, the lipstick and the color, but actually helping her by, with the process and the conversation we had during the process to get into the character. So I think it's like in this particular movie, obviously we had different conversations on a daily basis than on a happy comedy where you're, you know, as we are all actors ourselves as well in the makeup trail and you support whatever you're the makeup you're going to do, and you want to make sure that the actor, before he steps in front of the camera, gets has access to his part or his role. So, if he needs to be happy and funny, maybe you try to crack a joke in the morning when he comes in. Well, obviously this didn't happen on this show. So you come in and you you're quiet, and you observe, and you wait until the actor or the talent says something, and then you you. You know, that's, that goes from there. You know, yeah. This is in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and is it possible to have a look at these stills and maybe, Thomas, that we can sort of talk through? Um, <laughs> noise. <laughs> which was uh, very beautiful. So, was there an aging process? What does the story span over, time wise? Uh, so, no, that's uh, her. It's uh, it's, it's, no, it's, not it's all in one. Yeah, it's like one. Yeah. I've got them. Oh, sorry. How much 
I had a three weeks. Oh, what? That's yeah, not much. Because I got there, and they were basically they were all there, ready to go. I was going to talk about the tech tech wizards over there. Yeah. 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 Okay, three weeks. Are you thinking? Well, maybe it wasn't that. I thought it wasn't that. Yeah. It wasn't that. And that's so that's almost like a jump on the road. Yeah, go there yeah. and then you just go, go, go. And, and was it flat out when you got there? You sort of went in. I walked in, well, then we all got tested. Can you see? Get, uh, our vaccines. And then we uh, started, and it was, yeah, it was straight from there. Then I found my, I got my crew in the meantime between, uh, between flying from here, I called all my people. And then I found in the text, uh, Jason Hamer, who made our dummies for the you know, dead people, mm -hmm. uh, the dead baby. Uh, And so this developed while we were shooting with whatever came in the world, and we did that. And do you have a team that you work with predominantly, or do you sort of like crew up according to these? Uh, whenever possible, of course, I like to work with the people that I know and have worked with before, because, you know, if you say something, they know you, and they know what you mean by that, so you don't have to, there's no, there, there are no questions. So when I say something and I come back into the trailer, then I, I know that I'm, that's what, what I'm going to find. I don't have to go back and go like, oh no, when I said that, I didn't mean, you yeah. know, then you have to change everything. If that's possible, but if it's not possible, I'm also open to, I've worked on, I've moved to LA 30 years ago, I've done one movie in LA, all my other movies were in, from Kazakhstan, Africa, China, uh, Montana, like uh, Oklahoma, just not in LA. And I've met so many wonderful artists around the world <coughs> that uh, I thought was great because they learned a lot from how we do it in, in America. And I learned a lot how they do it in Kazakhstan. <laughs> you know, then you find your little thing, and you're like, oh my God, that is so simple. And so I'm going to take that home and I'm going to use that from now on, that's just myself. Yeah, yeah this is what we always say when we say anything like this before you arrive, about how, you know, even the, we have some of the, you know, we're lucky enough to have some of the greatest teachers coming in here mm -hmm. who are actively working in the industry and, and they will all t tell you a different way of doing things and it's almost like you've got to glean little bits of information and then kind of sort of make it your thing but yeah, I mean to this yeah. day I mean you know I'm, I'm learning every day on set yeah you know and I will always say to you that uh, before I start a film I can't sleep the night before to, to this day I can't and, and it, it is that sort of thing you constantly think oh what Got them, got something. Even if, if it's the simplest thing. It's the simplest thing. thing. Yeah. Okay, How do I get there? Problems, Where's you know? my car? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and it's about to be the facial hair or the yeah. wig or whatever or the, the appliance or that. I mean, it's just something. It's like, oh my God, oh my God. And then the next day, you do something. It's very, it's a beauty thing. Just yeah. glam, like nothing. Uh, you know, we've all done it a hundred times, thousand times before. But still, in the middle of the night, you go like, do I have my eyelashes? Oh, what about the, 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 the you know, where's the, where's, the nail, where's the nail polish or whatever? Yeah, we do it all the time, we do it all the time. But I think it needs that to actually then be able to, to be at your best, you know? I, I think so, and I kind of sort of think, if, if ever there was a time that I wasn't, it's, it's not even, I'm not even anxious because I'm not a nervous person in the least, but it's that sort of thing that I just always want to make sure that I'm kind of, doing everything that I'm expected to do and also as a, as a designer it's you, you, you you're you're there at the front but if something goes wrong mm -hmm. you know you're there with the uh, you know ready to take the bullet for people mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to troubleshoot all the time um, right so we, let, let's have a look at these pictures mm -hmm. there's well, the first one nice. I need to drive the so well, when you so in your three weeks of prep, <laughs> it's remarkable. Um, at what point did you do your makeup test? What was the process? Could you talk us through your sort of three weeks before yeah, the camera so, started rolling? So I first, when I first heard about it, I read the script and then I obviously immediately went online, researching the period, uh, mostly of course the French fashion that I played into the Osage, uh, Osage nation. And then when I got there, then I was <coughs> shopping in Walt, and like back in LA, uh, shopping, shipping, then shipping the personal stuff. Once we got there, then we had we had to wear masks, goggles, 
face shields and rubber gloves to go back to work at the beginning. And then obviously, you know, you, don't, you can't see a thing. Right? Mm -hmm. They never quite worked, did they? The, no, because there's always a glare or reflection, yeah. or especially when it's uh, the snow flurries start, you know, hitting the, the, the shield, and yeah. you're like, okay, where are you? Yeah. And of course, the rubber gloves, we, I was able to get rid of like after like three days, because whenever we laid facial hair, or there was glue involved, like there was always somebody ending up with a, a glove hanging down from their face. <laughs> 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 you said earlier, and I, and I, put, I, I literally need to make a note, like, stuff, I have to remember that, because when we went back, she after COVID is what you said about that thing of just guys you can't put a mask on over, over that beard you, you, you can't no please don't do that yeah. and you must have had it as well oh my god totally like, when they brought the shields COVID, out oh, when they brought no. the shields out i was like thank god yeah. Yeah. that that really did say that way, yeah that's right yeah and, like, and then it would be costume right it was what i said yeah the beards it, i must it say the beards was a hard one wasn't it but everything to do with COVID, for, for what we, because all of this, with, with all of your cast and, and, and your supporting actors, had to be covered to the last minute, and then it'll be just like, okay, take your mask off, and you'll be just like, oh. Well, and then I've only, because then it's in the middle of the summer, yeah. then it's, it's hot, like everybody's sweating. So there's no magic trick, then, it then will then melt. They, they have to hide their, you know, their costume runs around, making sure there's you no know, rubber bands sticking out of the pockets. We make sure that they actually take off the mask, and we have to go in. The hair like to glue down the the, the, the the laces, you know, front lace, and we have to go in and plot, you know, plot the actors because now they're wearing all original clothing, which is like from woolen long johns to like woolen suits with three-piece suits, and you're like, you know, do, do, do they really have to wear those long johns? I mean, can't you just get rid of, you know? So actually, it would help the situation, but of course, for to, for authenticity and for the situation, it was important for them to have that. So we would run in, plot the actors, and then all of a sudden, at one point, we realized there's this little white fine line now going sort of behind your ear, right? oh. and then you're like, oh no, like a tension line. No, it's actually from Sun the masks that. Because they have been wearing oh, those masks between, tan. between, <gasps> between tapes. <laughs> oh, so now they take off those masks, now they have these white lines. So now we have to run in, not only plotting them, we have to go and match the skin tones and then, you know, and then uh, plot them again and say, okay, let's shoot it. And before the tape is over or when it's cut, you run back in and do the same thing because now they have to put the masks back on. Yeah. And then some women, actually ladies, they took off their masks after a while, and they would wear a mask even without wearing a mask. Double I mean, mask. It was just like tan and white. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. then you have to go and. Uh, yeah. And as I said earlier on, because of in this on this movie, a lot of the actors came in, the indigenous actors came in and said, like, not just so I let you know. Uh, in, in some of them were paler than we were, you know, and they said, you know, in three months from now, even if we don't spend time in the sun, we'll be at least like three shades darker. Just, I'm just letting you know, and everybody basically said the same thing. So because of continuity reasons, uh, we shot that movie in like over a six month period, from March through September. That means we had snow flurries and the ice in the, in the beginning, then we had, uh, you know, 95% humidity, and it was like unbearably hot. And so, where people then would get darker, so we had to, for continuity reasons, in the beginning we had to warm skin tones up mm -hmm. a little bit, so it wouldn't happen that somebody would open the door, being, you know, being dark, and by the time they slam the door shut, and the, it's a cut, and this is the scene now inside that we can shot in the beginning of the movie and then all of a sudden they're totally pale, you know, mm. so it would be, so it yeah. would make sense. Is this just another thing you really do have to sort of pay attention to, like as in where about your film, in the, the, the longevity of the, the film, um, and if you are filming, like I film a lot as well in, in the hot countries, and you almost have to preempt the colour that your actor is going to go to, even if you're putting on 50 a day, um, your your actor will still get 
colour through that. And you can't sort of say, you know, much as you can keep umbrellas over and keep them shading, they, they will, if you're filming over a three month period in a hot country, the skin no will, yeah. like, there's no way around it. So what you have to do is preempt the colour. And if your story is only going over a two week span, then you've got to make sure that that actually is the same colour throughout the set, throughout the duration of the film. It's something to, that you've always got to be thinking about. It's another one of those things that you, you, you automatically think about, really, as a designer, don't you? Yeah. It's, it's something that, that you are always thinking about. Uh, we have a lot of that on Mumble Woman when they get, they, in Italy, where they get changing their outfits. It was just like, oh God, and they were sprayed and everything, but they were still all getting a colour. Yeah, yeah. It, and, then, just, and then depending on the on your ethnicity, I mean, I worked a movie where we everybody sent them to the spray booth, you know, they were all golden tanned, yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden the person from Sri Lanka, or like the person from like uh, from India, but they all started the same color, basically, yeah. when we started the movie, yeah. well, then the, the, the English person turns slightly red, so <laughs> the American person... Slightly red, another person <laughs> lied. <laughs> Like <laughs> <laughs> the American has like a golden tan, the Indian guy turns sort of like a more like a, a greenish, uh, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you have like five people and they all have to pick different uh, skin tones. You know? Oh, we love it. Don't we love it? Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing hair and Did you live at Hold on, you do hair and I do both makeup, hair and but you do hair and makeup because when you look after Jeff Bridges, mm -hmm. you do mm -hmm. both. both his hair and his makeup. Yeah, I've and been, you've been looking after him for quite some years, haven't you? I've been working with Jeff for twenty-five years, twenty-four years now. He's so honestly, I'm super jealous. He is a phenomenal. Oh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's lovely. He's the most wonderful person you can imagine. Oh, oh, darling. And we met on a movie called Sea Biscuit, and he. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> when I saw you saw Sea Biscuit, you did Sea Biscuit. I was like. I did on War Horse. We worked with one of the horses that did see oh, really? <laughs> that main horse. Wow, okay. That does the Liberty training. The Liberty yeah. horse. Uh -huh. He's worth millions of dollars. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a long time ago. I don't think he's still alive. Well, it was in 1999. I mean, we did it in. Uh, I think we shot it in 1999. So 2010, we shot. We shot. Okay. Okay. So he would have been 11. Yeah. yeah. So you started working with Jeff Bridges on Seabiscuit? On Seabiscuit, and I was the head of the department, and Jeff Bridges had his personal makeup artist, and he, I think he fell out of the trailer and hurt, he hurt his leg. Oh. And so they were looking for somebody, and uh, they asked him for names for makeup artists that could take over for the, his personal, because, you know, the star system has it that the star, number one, has a personal, not on every movie, but on yeah. most movies. So then I, me coming from, you know, I moved to LA in 1993 and I was very lucky that within just a few years I made it into the union and was able to work on those major studio pictures. And first it was The Patriot I did with Mel, Mel Gibson and then it was uh, Sea Biscuit and, um, and I said, well, you know, being from Switzerland where basically as the head of the makeup department number one and number two on the call sheet would definitely be sitting in your chair because uh, you know you designed the movie and i think you have a say in what the movie should look like and now if you have like all these personals then one feels that way about one thing and the other one feels another way about it and then all of a sudden it gets totally out of control and you have you lose track of the, of the look that you have designed for the movie that's why still to the day when I work with now, because I'm a personal as well, when I'm working with Jeff or other actors, but I always have a very close contact with the head of the makeup department. Uh, we discuss uh, blood colors, skin tones, sweat, uh, just the basics, the general uh, look of the movie, that we all agree that we do the same thing, that not the star doesn't sweat, or the star doesn't do this. Well, while everybody else is, everybody else is dirty, but the star is clean and fresh as a daisy. You know, we all make the movie together, and that's why everybody has to be on the same page. So when I said to production of Seabiscuit, and I said, well, in Switzerland, that's how it works. Number one and number two is on 
sitting, sits in my chair and I feel really here is a list of people but really I feel like I should be the one taking care of Mr. Bridges and then they told Jeff about it and then he says okay you want to have to have a makeup test and so I was very nervous of course I set up the table at the, my makeup station and everything and he sat down and I did the test and I told him why I did what and, and 10 minutes into the test he said hey don't worry about it you're fine we're fine you do, you, I'm going to be sitting in your chair and that was basically the end and of you've that. been with him ever since I've been with him ever since and he said you know the next movie he said oh my god I would love for you to do my next movie and I said absolutely thinking that you know how many times I've heard that before <laughs> if somebody said to me and says oh my god I can't even yeah. know, I can't even tell you I can't even imagine how life was uh, what life was before I met before. you and that from now on it's just going to be us and then the movie is over and then the movie is over and you never hear it again and now the different. so now he, uh, he approached me and he, and he said he one day he told me that he wants to be working with me for the rest of his career. If if that's in my interest too, then he would love me. And I said, I said hey, I mean, thank you, but you know, it's, of course I would love that. I mean, because he's such a wonderful person, very profound person. He has a great family. I know the family. I know his daughters. Uh, it's funny. It's profound. It's just like oh, it's just like family. So it's mm. wonderful. Cool. And getting, getting back to the, the mm -hmm. flowers, um, flowers of the flowers of the flowers of the flowers it's quite a long title to say, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so sitting all of that up, so you have the three weeks to get over there, and do you, did, does Martin Scorsese do camera tests? Per we say? did, yes, we did. Or has anything changed? No, uh, we did camera tests. He wanted, uh, I think I had four looks for Molly. And he wants to have an additional look, where she looks really, really bad. And But he's uh, very open for suggestions, and I have to say, all the tests that we did, we lined the, you know, the people up to, to show Marty, and he walked past it, and he basically, uh, I can't recall that he ever said, no, I don't want it like that, or maybe he said, during the test, he would maybe say, well, okay, now I want to see that, but stronger. Can I just ask you, when mm -hmm. you said that you lined them up to show Molly, mm -hmm. so Molly is your... No, Molly, uh, Martin. Oh, Ma oh Martin, no, okay. So, so you, you did the test on your actor that was playing Molly? With the actors, uh, you, we have like a several actors, they would come for the test, and then they have to wait, and then they, you know, we line them up, so they stand side by side, and Martin, Molly walked by the actors and approved it. Like, we had one actor, which was not a, or a character that is actually historically in the movie, but there was this character and he had this big mustache. And I looked him up online and, um, and I read that he had his <coughs> mustache uh, only shaven off once and he got paid a lot of money to do that mm -hmm. and he only did it for a good cause, for, for cancer or something. Or, and well, then I said, well, good luck with that. If you want to get rid of that mustache, it's either going to cost it's you or, you know, and then this, the, the, uh, the, before, the actor shows up and we, uh, we got him ready and he said, obviously, he said, well, I guess I don't, we don't need to discuss your facial hair. He said, no, absolutely not. And then he stood out there. He stood there, Marty came, and the actor said, I have no nudity in my contract, so the mustache stays. And <laughs> <laughs> just cracked up laughing because it didn't really, you know, I mean, it was, a, it was a period mustache, so it actually didn't matter because it was not historic, it was a historical figure that we had to follow, that, that needed, to be, needed to be accurate. So, but that was quite funny. <laughs> so was there a lot of facial hair in, in the film? Uh, we had BG wise, we had a lot of facial hair, and then the ones that were, you know, just uh, historical figures that had facial hair. But these people, the actors that were there, there was, they came and stayed basically throughout the whole time. Even if they had like a couple of days in the beginning and a couple of days at the end, some people actually stayed for months at the time there, just like staying in their hotel rooms because of COVID. Mm -hmm. They couldn't really go anywhere, so they were staying at their hotel rooms. 
<laughs> and so, and was the, the town apparently was built on on land outside the original town? The uh, we shot we stayed in a place called Barnesville, which is thirty miles from Bahashka, and mm -hmm. Bahashka is then Osage Nation. Um, and so, so we shot in Osage Nation, and yeah, buildings were like houses were built on that. So, you know, you would drive up the freeway, I went for like a half an hour and then turn left. And we drove like, you know, for the next 25 miles through just like a dust cloud. And if you had somebody ahead in front of you for like another 15 miles, and there was the house. Um, uh, so that, the house and did they build a street there as well? Or, they or? built streets to actually have some of them to have access to those places where we shot. Uh, because some of them were re literally in the middle of nowhere. And how did that implicate with you guys? Like sometimes, like on lo if you're on location, so your makeup trucks are mm -hmm. way outside, way down the road. You jump in. Is it the normal? You jump in the minibus and you go out and hope there's a marquee no, there we or had some actually, checks corner or. Our transport uh, department was actually pretty really good. I mean, we had our makeup trailer was, I would say, 99 percent. Of the time it was on the sites. Oh, great. So, the, yeah. Or we had access to, like, the, you know, we had, like, these, uh, what do you call them, like, uh, we had the trailers, and then we had those, uh, like, those, you know, where people have lunch. Oh, the pop-ups, yeah. Yeah, like the, yeah, it's not a pop-up. Like a marquee. Yeah, it's like a big square room where they, yeah. they where the tables are inside normally. Yeah. That's what they brought in for the VG, for the background, uh -huh. for the extras. And sometimes there were a couple of times where we had to work out of the, you know, you, you take your things with you and work out of one of those uh, yeah. trucks. Yeah, I mean it's another thing worth thinking about, guys, because you know whenever you're on set, you know once you once you've left the makeup trailer in the morning, sometimes you don't go back to the makeup mm -hmm. trailer till the evening, and so whatever you're taking on that little minibus ride um, needs to cover pretty much anything that you might need to cover during the day. Yeah, not only that, maybe also the scene that follows the scene, the first scene, because you might not have time to actually yeah. travel yeah. back. Yeah, we do a lot of changes on set. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's usually, usually if, you're, if you've got big actors, big name actors with you, there's usually a little wee bagel or, or something set up for them, so you are kind of pop in with them on mm. and do it in there. But there is always a place, you know, they, they, there is always a situation where you, you kind of almost have to scan the set when you get there and think, okay, that's a good corner. If I need to do something fast, mm -hmm. that, 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 there's a good corner to do it. There's a PowerPoint. You know, you, you need to, you, you're sort of thinking, I, I might need to plug in, I might need to do this and that. So you just sort of like, you know, make sure that everything's there. It's mm -hmm. almost like second nature, isn't it? When yeah. you go down to the set and you, yeah, you, yeah. you subconsciously are looking for it. Uh, and I know that I always ask for white easy ups um, because often if, you, if you're given a black easy up tent, it's so dark inside that you can't, you can't see anything. So quite often you, you sort of request uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the white easy ups. Um, cool, where are we? But we wanted to talk about Molly and uh, yes. I thought it was, uh, we did like four looks with mm -hmm. her. Yes. And then uh, Martin Walter wanted one more and one of the essential things was that she was uh, she you know we had the people as I said like the, the, the women because they're rich and they have uh, money some of them were uh, uh, more into the French fashion but then you had the other people like Molly who was more sort of the, the natural uh, traditional type so we so in order to separate them we kept the makeup obviously you know, obviously she was very natural looking and she showed a lot of skin. We wanted to see the skin glow. So whatever product they used, they wanted to make sure that it's not matte or flat or look in any way whatsoever like makeup, you know. And I keep pointing out that no makeup look doesn't mean no makeup. You know, oftentimes actually no makeup look, for me anyway, is more difficult to achieve or more challenging to actually hide and cover, you know, you still use your products to, to hide th certain things you don't want to see. At the same time, you don't want them to pop so they look like makeup. 
And in the more modern movie where somebody wears makeup and it's obviously makeup where it doesn't matter, that's okay. Where in this case, because it's a period movie and it's from the 1920s, we definitely did not want to see makeup on anybody's face, especially because of the, the nature and the humidity of the, the time of the year and all of that. You know, even if they were made up, you, I mean, first of all, we could not keep it up because there was all this, you know, blocking off the sweat. At the same time, these people wearing all these woolen blankets, there was no way that they would have run around with powdered faces at the time either. You know, just like to think that makes just mm. sense. Makes you know. sense. Yeah. Can I ask you what your run, um, obviously because, yeah, I mean, no makeup, makeup is, is, is an art. It is an art. Uh, and the camera should be able to get this close yeah. and you're not looking at any makeup at all. What's mm. your go to? You know, have you got a favourite or? Like a, bra like a brand or? Well, I used to. I started, I know. I started with. This is your arm. Still the best. Still the best. You know what? But they stopped doing it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I don't let anyone touch my, my few remaining products. I know, it's like I have my... And they go. I think I've got like, yeah. Yeah, this is just like every, every makeup brand, I think they have this magic number. And yeah. I think in our case, it's like number three. So <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's like, isn't it great? It's it's true. Like, because it's good for dark, it's yeah. good to, for light. Yeah. It has, and it's transparent it enough. It has great it. coverage if yeah. you want, but at the same time, you can use your... You, you can use a brush, you can use a sponge, you can use it either which way. I mean, it always works and it has a great color. It's a little on the reddish side maybe for some people, but mix that with other products we use on her. I used uh, like, uh, uh, like tinted uh, skin oils mixed with uh, Visiora that I uh, blended. Yeah. So I just made to make sure that she has a natural glow. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then here and there she had a hint of lip color mm -hmm. for when she's healthy, a little like a blush, you know, it's just, so it doesn't look like blush, but she has some like readiness to her for like cheeks and everything was just very, uh, very soft, uh, nothing too defined. And obviously it stayed all in the brown tones, like natural tones, mm -hmm. skin tones. Um, and when she gets uh, sick, then we had, I added um, like circles darken her eyes with like in the browns as well, like mm -hmm. brown, purple, green, and but ever so light, and we're blending it out and washing it, and like you know, and um, yeah, where her, where her sister, on the other hand, Anna, then she was more influenced by the French fashion, mm -hmm. so then we. Do we have anything of her sister of her? I think I saw one actually. We can leave the tech list sorting that out. Yes, that would be lovely. Because what you're saying about the, the lips and things, because I often do a little whatever's on the cheeks, I kind of tend to do a little bit with lip balm and yeah. on the lips and things. But, but, yeah, right there. I think that's Right, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you can even see the present here. It's kind of quite a modern one, but the period is quite a fashionable hat. Well, she has the 20s. That's the French influence. That's the French influence. Yeah, you can see it. You can really see it. She still wears the blanket. Yeah. But it's so lovely. Can you see this, guys? Because you can almost see with the coat collar and everything. She she looks like she's literally just come out of a Paris fashion week in the 20s. But she's still got a traditional blanket around her. Can you see? Yeah. Do you work closely yeah. with your costume? Mm. Design? Yeah, very I, I do. I think mm. that's my first portfolio. Yeah, costume. Yeah. 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 Because what's also great is on this movie, you know, like some of them, some of the ladies they came in after they went through the, through hair. They used a lot of had a lot of wigs. And for the men they had a lot of extensions. So because you know, like nowadays, all the guys have this short bust hair on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they needed yeah. wigs, they needed the braids. Um, and, uh, and when you have somebody walk into the trailer, either they have already read their costume or the wig, or then you, I mean, it's, uh, it's there. You don't you have to, you just look at it and you know exactly what you have to do to support. 
this, the silhouette of this character? I sometimes prefer the costume on the I prefer them coming in with costume. Yeah, sometimes they don't sometimes. like Sometimes. Yeah, I know, but yeah. yeah. And I find it so much better because you just, it feels like you finish it. Yeah. But you do always, so whether you're dealing with, with your um, principal actors or supporting actors, that you like, if we're ever setting up looks for any actors, if they've got a hat, there is a big hat discussion <laughs> always. And they'll be, you know, your costume designer will come on with the hat. They will let us know, especially with the period hat, 20s, 30s, whatever, but, but, but it will be where its position is really, really important. There's a whole book on it. It's true. Best you not get it wrong, because uh, it, is, it is knowing exactly where that. Yeah, of course. And some of the hair, like some of the hair, especially the ladies' hats, they were part of the hairstyle. I mean, you could have, they would only fit like one way, and the hair was sort of combed around, you know, like dressed around the, the hat. When you're doing the period film, especially in the 20s, and you've got a lot of the cloche low hats, mm -hmm. quite often you'll find that it, when you take them off, at the end of the day, there's literally a strip of finger waved hair on the yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. stuck on, underneath, like some yeah. sort of cartoons. Mm -hmm. um, how long have we got left? Do we want to do certain mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. uh, have we got questions coming in, or, or can I go into uh, my yeah, trusty little jar, please? This is a jar from the oh, students. Oh, okay. so they, 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 <laughs> we have this thing where they, whenever I ask, guys to ask me questions, they always forget. So they now, what they do is they write it all down. So if you want them back to you this week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this is about who's the, who's the winner. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, do you want me to read that? Sure. Well, we're just on this. Um, what products did you use for the movie? We kind of just sort of like covered that. Mm -hmm. And I also, I also always make sure that the artists that I'm working with that I don't tell them what products that they have to use. I tell them what the goal is, what we want to achieve. And what, you know, everybody has a preference, and there's so many products out there that there's not one product that is right. It might be right for you, but it doesn't work for somebody else. So as long as we all achieve the same goal within the range of products that are available to us, I think it's great. Did you always want to be a makeup artist or designer, um, or did you fall into the job? Uh, good question. I wanted to be, actually, I wanted to, at one point I tried to be an actor. I went to acting school, and that's how I came in touch with makeup. And, uh, yeah, and I realized I wasn't going to be a good actor. <laughs> Especially a stage actor, so I was always more keen in helping people getting ready, or feeling around there, fussing with their clothes and behind the curtain, and I was almost the one looking through the curtain, making sure, yes, that right there, that was great. I didn't need to be the one in front of the, in front of the curtain or in front of the camera, so I would much more prefer it that way, and I'm very happy with that choice. Do you have a favorite period you like? I like 40s a lot. I like uh, anything between the 20s and 50s, 60s still. Anything later doesn't feel like period to me, really, uh -huh. because I'm part of that. They're part of my. Because I'm just like, well, the 90s is the 90s. Yeah, right. So yeah, it's just like, nothing happened. Right. Except for the previous lot, really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is sort of like taking us away from the um, clues of brown room for a minute, um, onto Avatar. Mm -hmm. uh, did you. You were doing prosthetic makeup mm -hmm. on Avatar? Well, I did. Uh, I did all the designs for the wounds for Avatar 2 and 3. Big wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big wow. The audience there. I didn't, but I didn't actually spend time on set in New Zealand with them. I was hired and uh, specifically to design those wounds in Los Angeles. And I worked in the production office and the studio was in Manhattan Beach. So I would commute between there and my house. and. I think I did like 183 uh, wounds from fresh cut, uh, uh, like uh, uh, stapled or with thread, then with a little scare, then no scare, then uh, knife wounds with a rusty uh, knife, with a sharp blade, with a dull blade, with a three inch long thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
The ones that I designed were specifically made for the avatar character, but because uh, James Cameron likes, uh, didn't want to create it digitally, so he asked me to create it uh, physically, like create the rooms, uh, design them, and make the rooms and molds, and then we tested them on people, and then if he, they got approved, and then I took the mold, the negatives that I had, and of course, uh, like uh, um, plaster, or like it was a 37% grayscale of these models that I, I poured. Because, you know, if, if they're white, then the, the, light, the light reflects and you can't see the details of the wounds, you know. And if, it, if they're black, they absorb the light and then you can't see anything either. So a 37% grayscale is the perfect color for for visibility of all the details in anything. And so when I poured these uh, these uh, sculptures, I did that in those in those in that 37% grayscale, and then they were able to actually film it and photograph it, and then create 3D models, and then apply it to the avatars. Amazing. Wow. Okay. During the process of the avatars, they were all like they, they were running around our sets with uh, suits with, with hundreds of dots on it. So I would say post it was part of the CG process. I guess. Cool. Um, back to Achilles of the Flower Moon. Was there ever a day? It's a very good question. Um, that you had to do a fast improvisation on the set that he wasn't expecting? Was there a day when something happened he wasn't expecting? Uh, we actually we did. And it was actually uh, a scene where we had, uh, 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 in a scene where you know a house had burned down, there was a, a wounds and there, were, there was blood, there was um, a body that I had um, not prepared for in that way. But they wanted more, more, more blood, and more. Yeah? And what I have made before was like I have these sheets that are like, like this, like that, right? And I took from liver, um, intestines, uh, heart, um, like chopped meat, uh, 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 bacon, chops of pieces of bacon. I put them on a tray and then I made a negative of that and then of course it was like a, a latex, some of them are latex, some of them are silicone and then I would bloody them up and then you can actually choose and you can cut it to, to size, whatever you like. If you want it to be look like grain, you take the, the you take the, 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 the bacon, you the intestines and if you want to look some, like something else. So I had sheets of those with me, and the great thing is if you bloody them up and let it dry, you could actually rip a, a blouse or a shirt open, you shove it inside, and someone's like, uh, you know, you <laughs> just spray it with water, and it starts bleeding, and it's right there. Hmm? So it comes to life. And then it comes to life, yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of I should it's sell them, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but is it, what, what you're sort of saying is a really interesting note here, is that wherever you're filming in the world, whether you're in... New York or in a third world country, go and find what is to sell in the local supermarket because you will need gelatin, you will need all sorts of things, like you're saying about bacon, all sorts of things you, 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 will, you will have to go and grab. You know, I've, I've shown hair off goats before to play on the you, you will find it. Um, okay, where did you get your inspiration for? What inspires you? Uh, on a job, is, is there anything that kind of builds you in, or, or what, what sort of gives you your inspiration? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's a story as a start. When you read a script, then you have to be first have to like the story. I don't think I feel lucky that I've never. I don't think I've ever worked in a movie there where I didn't like the story. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. Except maybe if it would have been because 
chance for some yes, somebody, yeah. but luckily, also with him, I know that he's cutting his taste. He, does. he, he chooses, and he chooses. Yeah. It used to be almost like people used to say, with him it's like giving birth. You know, he takes, I mean, he really has to uh, digest it to like the story, to make it his own before he can actually say yes and uh, accept the offer. And then once he's there, I mean, then he becomes these people. Yeah. And it's really quite wonderful. So I think the inspiration is the movie and then of course the period. And then, uh, and then also the actors that actually yeah. that you meet and then you get inspired by their uh, you know, yeah. approach to the project. Yeah, and we just, we talked we discussed this the other week when I, when I when I said to you never ever underestimate what an actor will bring to the table. Good actors, when you watch them, mm -hmm. it's it's like you, you won't believe you're being paid to actually sort of like work with them. Very good. Yeah. Uh, any tips for starting out in the industry? Um, I would like. I mean, how it worked for me was that I was, uh, I was happy to be where I was, to get the job, to be invited, to support a project, or to support somebody, to listen to what they have to say, uh, take criticism, and learn from that, and know what you can, what you can offer, to suggest things, uh, how you see it, and maybe. You know, everybody can learn from everybody. So even if you're a department head, I can learn from somebody who comes into my trailer and offers something to me. But if, of course, if there's a reason why I cannot accept it, or I, I tell you, this is not the color palette that we're working with. Like on this movie, we have color uh, palettes created just for this particular movie, for the people, power people. If you say blue, and if I know, sorry, blue didn't exist at the time. However, I really like this and this idea. So I think it's just important to be open and aware of what's going on. And take, also be able to take criticism. You know? yeah. I think these days, I think you know that. Because I remember, like the actors, chair, you know, like when you come on the set, there's a whole row of chairs, and they have, they have names on it of all the actors that they are there. Those are the actors' chairs, and nobody sits in those chairs except the actors. That's why they're the actors' chairs. And for me, it was clear from the beginning those chairs they don't even exist. Even if they're right in front of me, I don't even see them because I walk around there back and forth. They're not there for me. Even if they're empty, it's not my chair. And now lately in the last few years, I've noticed quite a bit that somebody would come in, from makeup department or hair or like a costume, they would go, ugh, you know, they throw their bag onto the chair and and you're like, uh, you know, that's not your chair. So, so, did you see anybody? Is anybody here? Is that, no, but they're coming in a minute, and it's not your chair. It's like, what do you, how, who are you to tell me? It's like, well, okay, I won't tell you anymore. Well, the door opens, the actor comes in, and looks at his chair, and there's a bag sitting on his chair. You know, obviously he's unhappy about it, maybe he would say something, but it creates an unnecessary tension. It creates a situation that could be totally have been avoided if everybody just listens to how it works. Set etiquette, you know. And set etiquette. The last question was the hardest part of your job. You kind of sort of just covered that in that because it's also that thing. What you're saying is, is, is understanding what, what your job is as well, yes. isn't it? In, in the thing that you, you, you know, the question that always <coughs> comes through here is, is how do you work on on getting your design across mm -hmm. and I would always say is if you've got all these people to factor in, like your actor, like I find it really hard talking about what you can do to an actor until the actor's sitting down with me and we've discussed it. Yeah. Um, because you don't really know until the actor's been cast, but for some reason the studio always wants to know. Just quickly, um, because we're, we're sort of running out of time here, three things in your setback that you couldn't live without. Uh, um, 
Yay! <laughs> I just explained to them about a room stick. What we, okay, so we're from the same generation. <laughs> my, 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 a camouflage palette. Yeah. And a, a color, um, just a basic, uh, uh, like a, like a, uh, a color palette of like crab. Like the boost pack. Oh. basically, weirdly, this is, this is when I put together your set bag all those years ago, it was always that thing that you had to have that grease paint palette because they, when, and that's, this is exactly um, was my thoughts as well, it's, it's the camouflage palette, your grease paint palette, yeah, your roots. The root that's got mainly hair and, and yeah. beards and things like that. But you well, should you be able to any of those, any of the colours that you need and it will get you out of all sorts of... Oh, Ruth's going to go use dirty fingernails. Uh, I, look, uh, I seriously, we like, just I talked know. about it. <laughs> dirty and down is not cool, but honestly, I mean, yeah. you, you'll, you'll get to this bit, guys, about how obsessed I am about dirty and down and about sort of, you know, ears and, and fingers. My tips for dirty is sponge it on, sponge it off. off. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Don't just put it on yeah. and leave it, just like put it on and take it off. Grind it in. Yeah, Find it in with a wet wipe. Can I ask one question? <laughs> do you ever use William Tuttle? I do, I do for for anything like yeah, because it's an old makeup I know, that I, use, I grew up with. Yeah, I still use his powder. Right. Like his loose powder, face powder. Because I thought on this with all the um, different skin types, because he has those levels, you mm -hmm. know, with the Chinese one, Chinese two. Mm -hmm. The it's a an old school. I use a lot of, if not Viseora, I use a lot of RCMA. RCMA. Sorry? RCMA. Yeah. Of like, course, the Shintos and, yeah. yeah. I thought, I just thought because with the William Tuttle, I always found it like a high pigment. Mm -hmm. But what you were saying about the high pigment, and because I do a lot of natural makeup, mm -hmm. that's kind of my forte. I mm -hmm. love it. So the high pigment with the, um, with the sheerness and the still getting through without having to see it. Mm -hmm. I know it's a, it's a makeup that not many people use anymore because, you know, in his time probably in the early what, 40s. I used 50s. to use a makeup with called Indio. Yes, I've done that one too. And there was Deo Magic Color, it was a 704B. Yep. <laughs> <And you're right. laughs> you remember all these guys because yeah. we'll, we'll be asking for like Lake. And, uh, but they, yes. they, don't, they don't exist anymore, it was an Italian. Uh, I lived sisters. in Rome for 20 years. They make this make yeah. it in their kitchen, basically. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, yeah, and then I think I might even have it for you. Right, guys, we have come to our favourite move. Uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 I'm D152. Yeah. Mine's so Ripper. I've yeah. got a new blue, Ripper FX. Amazing. No, mine is uh, $700. Not the 155 three, one. Uh, 305, it's called the... Uh, oh, the Telesis 305. Yeah, the 355, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah see, it's all because... I've got I that too. <laughs> like, you know, all of a sudden, they're like, no problem. I was so, telling the students about oh, that Telesis has taken over for the 355, really, uh, why we don't do it anymore, yeah, yeah, and... It was a medical adhesive. Guys, yeah. big round for Thomas, thank you very yes. much. <laughs> so I know you're on, on, on strict time, so do you have to go to the south bank now? Uh, well, we've got to have tea. Well, I mean,